Hello and welcome to the sixth episode of Scroll Ideas. By now, you guys know the drill. For the next one hour, we'll be debating and discussing an idea that Indians are particularly taken up by. And we'll be doing it with a brainy guest who will help us break down the concepts involved. For this episode, I have with me uh, Nalan Mehta. Uh, Nalan wears uh, many, many hats. He's one of the polymaths we get on school writers once in a while to make you feel a bit bad about your life. Uh, he's the dean of a media school. He's taught at universities. He's worked as a journalist in print and TV. He's also authored multiple books uh, on topics as varied as uh, media studies, sports, and politics. And it's the last uh, and final bit that we'll be discussing on this episode. Uh, Nalan has written a book called The New BJP, which charts, breaks down, and explains the rise of Modi's BJP, the post-2014 BJP, uh, which, uh, as we all know, is the central pole of Indian politics. It's, it's almost a juggernaut. It's winning election after election. And Nalin tries to break this down using uh, both quantitative and qualitative uh, research. Hi, Nalin. Welcome to Stroll Ideas. Very pleased to have you. Thanks very much, Shoaib, and thanks for that very generous introduction. Uh, delighted to be here on Scroll, and hopefully we can deep dive into some of these ideas and uh, because it's something which is very central to all our lives, whether we like BJP or don't like it or are agnostic to it. I think it affects all of us, uh, politics. So uh, looking forward to a good chat. Right. Let's just dive right into it. The One of the one of the main theses of your book is that... Uh, the BJP throughout his life has been, most of his life has been known as a Brahmin Banya party, has been known as an upper caste party. But you're arguing that the BJP as it exists today does not fit that description. In fact, you're right that the charge of upper caste domination is difficult to make with such electoral representation. You argue that the BJP gives other backward castes and Dalits a fair bit of representation. Break this down for us. Why do you think that's the case? Oh, absolutely, uh, Shoaib. I think uh, the BJP and its predecessor, the Jansang, which was formed in 1951, um, both of them were, uh, and, and both the Jansang and what I call the old BJP, which was uh, from 1980 uh, to about 2014 um, uh, in that form. Uh, and that BJP was basically the uh, Vajpayee Advani BJP. Um, that was fundamentally a Brahmin Baniya party, as you pointed out. It was fundamentally an urban party. Uh, it never struck roots, uh, except in some areas, in rural areas. Um, uh, this BJP, the new BJP, which I think, um, uh, to put it bluntly, Narendra Modi uh, crafted, um, and which we've seen the electoral advances it's made post-2014 onwards, which continued in 2019, continued in multiple state elections in different geographies and so on. So, th so this BJP has lost more elections than it has won um, sorry, it is, it is one more election than it has lost since 2014, right. both at the central and state level, or done better in, in those elections compared to before. Now, why that has happened is because, and that's the question I was trying to answer, that look, whether you like, support, hate BJP, something is fundamentally shifting in our politics. And why is that happening? Why are these guys winning? Now, there are multiple reasons for their electoral advances, one of them and one of the key ones is that the basic DNA of the BJP has changed. Um, and this old BJP from being urban, Banya, Dom, Banya, Brahmin, upper caste has become a totally different animal post-2014 as the new BJP. Now, why do I say that? Now, this flies in the face of all conventional understanding, all academic frameworks, and what uh, most people who studied politics in India basically argued. Um, I'll give you an example. Christoph Jafferlaw, for example, has argued, um, pre preeminent scholar of Hindu nationalism. Um, the Ashoka University Center, um, uh, the very center, for example, uh, which, which which Gilles Verniers runs. These all, uh, a lot of the data they produce that, that basically continued to show that um, um, the BGP remained an upper caste party and they looked essentially at parliamentarians. What we were doing essentially was that um, now, when I was traveling as a journalist, I was finding on the ground that a lot of things were shifting. Uh, but that was anecdotal. You know, you uh, you can't look at structural things purely based on, oh, I went here and I heard somebody telling me this. Well, that may be for that. We have to put the context. So what we did was, uh, um, Shoaib, that we created something called the Mehta Singh Index. What that meant was that we studied uh, in UP. We looked at UP and we studied uh, 4,400 politicians across four parties. 
बीजेपी समाजवादी पार्टी कांग्रेस एंड बीएसपी ओवर अ थर्टी प्लस ईयर पीरियड फ्रॉम नाइनटीन नाइनटी टू टू थाउजेंड नाइनटीन and we looked at different metrics we looked at lok sabha candidates of these parties we looked at vidhan sabha candidates we looked at um, the uh, the people who became ministers in different parties we looked at uh, 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 party office bearers um, and we looked at district level uh, party apparatus as well to give a holistic understanding of the social metric uh, of who is it uh, who is who is the politician in these parties right and now just to before i tell you what we found in that now uh, you know i was saying that the dominant paradigm was it's an upper caste party it that it was um now just to give you the context there were two poles of this debate right uh, when i started looking at this in fact i had no intention of looking at this very closely because um i also thought that it was an upper caste party when i started doing this research so the two poles that started off this debate was that jafar law who is at cnc ans co for example a very eminent scholar he argued that the bjp's triumph in 2014 and even more so in 2019 was fundamentally a revenge of the upper caste elites that the bjp became the behemoth that it did because the upper caste somehow led some kind of a, a grand revolution and, and 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 they basically put everybody down and that is what explains this um, to simplify a complex point they make but that's basically the point um narendra modi in uh, sometime in uh, uh, last year gave a speech to his uh, parliamentary party where he gave exactly the opposite figures uh, uh, because when jafar law made the argument he had certain figures of of, of the social composition of parliamentarians of the bjp and he made it based on that it wasn't just out, out of thin air it was based on data they had collected modi on the other hand gave opposite numbers modi said that 68.9% of bjp's mps elected in 2019 were either obc or scheduled caste or scheduled tribe Uh, roughly around 113 out of the 303 uh, uh, MPs that got elected in 2019 for the BJP, right? If you take out those who got elected from reserved seats for scheduled castes or scheduled tribes, even then, roughly about 60% of the BJP's MPs were still from these categories. Now, if if that is right, then the charge of upper caste bias does not exist. I mean, then it just doesn't make sense. No. So what I was the reason why I jumped into this was. i was studying this phenomenon and i saw this claim by modi on one side and then from the dominant academic paradigm on the other side both of them didn't square either one one of them was wrong now there was no way to check who was uh, the only way to check it was to look at the data afresh because uh, the ashoka data wasn't available publicly in the public domain only the results were and and modi's point also was that he had made the analysis and announced it in a public speech so what we did was we said look let's step away from this let's take a fresh revisionist look at this and members of parliament are not enough let's look at all structures of representation mps mlas ticket ticket uh, ministers all of that and this is what we did when we created this we what we found was and like i said in the mehta singh index over a, which i which sanjeev singh my colleague um and a number of people were involved in this um what we found was at a macro level that in the bjp's to give you a snapshot in the bjp's lok sabha candidates in up this was specific to up in 2019 um obcs and scheduled castes together accounted for 57.5% of the bjp's candidates in up and bjp swept up huh? so these weren't just uh. ticks in boxes these were winning candidates most uh. of them um these weren't just something to fill a representation quota right um um that was 57.5% the same category obc and scs when you look at the vidhan sabha candidates fielded by bjp in 2017 in up an election again which it swept um 52.8% um you look at the office bearers of the bjp it was around it, it was not around it was exactly 50% then we looked at the um uh, yogi adityanath when he became chief minister in 2017 after they swept the election um right. we looked at his council of ministers and we compared it with other parties um of course there was a charge of thakur dominance on yogi adityanath uh, there was a whole thing around ki ye thakurvad hai so what i found fascinating i mean i i couldn't believe the data when i first saw it because we and we checked it five times or multiple times to make sure we weren't making mistakes i couldn't believe it was that in his council of ministers 48.1% of ministers were either obc or sc and when you looked at thakurs and brahmins obcs were more than brahmins or thakurs and then uh, interestingly it's not just uh, 
that the comp- relative composition to each other when we compared with akhilesh yadav's previous government and akhilesh yadav's samajwadi party was the party of the obcs there were more obcs in the bjp government than there were in akhilesh yadav's government in fact there were more thakurs in akhilesh yadav than there were in yogi adityanath's uh, uh, government and the difference was that in the akhilesh yadav's cabinet the council of ministers i meant council of ministers right right got it. we looked at both we looked at cabinet council ministers the right. proportions were roughly similar and what right. i mean to say was that the difference was you know there are obcs and there are obcs the difference was that in the case of akhilesh yadav um uh, the um, the all but one of the obc ministers was a was a yadav right only one was a non yadav obc among ministers in the case of yogi adityanath almost every all but one or, or in fact it's, a, it's a, almost every single minister was a non yadav obc so that was the difference so bjp essentially was driven by non yadav obcs and non jatav dalits which is basically right. what happened i mean and it's the same thing uh, uh, then we looked at district president district president there was these categories obc plus sc was around 35.6% i mean there are 98 district presidents of the bjp in up which up doesn't have 98 district but bjp has more than one president in several districts that's okay. why 98 and there uh, again it was at a lesser percent but that you could see this shift happening now the thing was that at every level parliament vidhan sabha office bearers um uh, council of ministers district level a uh, district level to a lesser extent you were finding the similar percentages of these categories so that was not just an accident it was part of a concerted strategy to bring more people into your tent people who never voted for you before in these numbers right right um and by the way this was not just at this was just the apex of the pyramid right then we e- even at the ground level the bjp set up booth level committees and uh, they put in reservations for women um at the booth level so uh, a 21 member karyakarini hoti hai district level pe so in up for example they put in put aside x number of seats for scs and obcs um uh, x number of 5 out of 21 in every dis- in every booth level district level and so on was for women so many of them originally of course were agar mahila leke aani hai to kisi ki bhai behan hogi kisi ki kisi karyakarta ki bivi hogi kuch hoga lekin agar panch aise aayenge to ek waisi aayegi jo kisi is us parivar se hogi jo usne kabhi bjp ke liye vote nahi kiya so gradually they built that so the social composition changed the, the long and short of it was um so if that the data showed us that the bjp but from 2014 to 2019 um mm. and the book is it looked at data in that five year period became in up the most socially representative party by caste compared to every other party fighting that election barring muslims and that is an important point to make right. um, and we'll come to that uh, yeah yeah and so in comparison to every other party it was more representative and in comparison to what the pre 2014 bjp was the, the shift was at two levels right? right what was interesting was that now these changes were not reversible i mean they could have reversed right i mean because for example in the 2022 lo- up election you saw many of these obc ministers defected some of them went back before the, in the run up to the election yeah. so a lot of people felt that the social coalition is bro- breaking down ki aapne mm. logo ko le to aaye apne tent mein but but did you give them samman did you give them enough space so right. it could have been reversed especially because you now spent 5 years in power under yogi adityanath but what the result showed us was that the people who defected back from these obc leaders most of them lost their own seats and bjp won in those seats with obc support only in fact the mm-hmm. changes that drove the bjp's advances in 14 17 and 19 instead of reversing they had taken far deeper root and that's what 2022 election showed us and this reflected in the voter result as well if you see the csds survey uh, and you see the access by my india poll survey csds has been tracking date election data for for a very very long time the csds right. data shows that absolutely that this what i'm sh- saying in the political representation of the bjp structures that reflected directly in how voters voted in up as well god what do you think is driving this from the ground is it uh, so for 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 just give us an example so say you have a non yadav obc right hmm. uh what's what's driving him to suddenly say leave maybe he was voting for akhilesh earlier and now he's hmm. voting with the bjp is it because now there is a person from his caste uh, who's a pad adhikari at the district level is it is he is he getting better welfare is it a combination 
what's 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 you've given the top down but what's the bottom up what's making this man change yeah. his vote so i'm um, you know i went to a lot of villages and spoke to a lot of people on this uh, across party lines um right. uh, including to uh, uh, to many people who just can't stand the bjp um and um i think there are two or three things see there was a caste representation is not a new thing you know everybody all parties have experimented with social engineering right um from the time of the ram temple uh, movement there has been this the, these two great paradigms that are dominant in politics right i mean mandal versus kamandal right mandal um, and so on and so forth um there was an older model the congress used to be this tent which which also included muslims of course uh, right. which was basically a party for everybody everybody was that whole social coalition with all its contradictions was inside the congress tent um but that model with the bjp also it's not like obcs did not vote for bjp earlier they did but in much lesser numbers after all the first uh, uh, bjp chief minister in up kalyan singh under whose regime uh, when he was chief minister the babri masjid was demolished he was an obc the usse bada obc neta kaun tha bjp ka kalyan singh tha right so i am not saying that in fact i would say even OBC the ram janmabhoomi movement had a fair bit of obc Uh, right representation right. if i'm not wrong the the difference was the bjp never won majorities right. earlier it didn't have that kind of massive support it had certain right. sections of the obcs certain uh, uh, which came and then went certain sections right. to much lesser extent of scheduled castes and largely upper castes so what has happened is right. the upper castes remained with the bjp uh, or country but that strengthened see um, that model was a totem pole kind of model that you have a kalyan singh or you have a, a dalit leader who you right. think that because that person is from that community therefore a significant proportion of that community will come with you it is kind of like what jagdeepan ram was for for um, congress. congress and so on what is shifted uh, uh, i think on the ground is right firstly the mandal parties or the post mandal parties which is basically bsp and samajwadi party in um, uh um up and rjd in bihar among others um um and to, to name just a, uh, two or three mm-hmm. of them um fundamentally they became caste based parties they were the parties of social reform that's how they were born they were lohiyaite parties right uh, uh right at least at least the samajwadi party was kashiram began by talking about obc and sc unity in the beginning um but then they became fundamentally the obc party fund, uh, the the samajwadi party fundamentally fundamentally became an ahir party it became a party of yadavs um okay. uh, the mayawati's party fundamentally became a party of jatavs now there are there are 70 plus obc uh, um uh, uh, the, the up uh, state list of obcs list 70 plus caste as obcs now if most of the positions of power and pelf are, are occupied by yadavs others have been are there but they're not getting much of the spoils of power or anything what the bjp did i mean and this is i think what the difference was the bjp knew that the yadav is not going to shift fundamentally most yadavs are not going to shift or most jatavs will not shift so what they did was they focused on non yadavs and non uh, uh, and and non uh, jatavs and they basically said aapko wahan pe kya mila hum aapko bhagidari dete so that's what i was saying the bjp this was this didn't happen in isolation they did a massive cadre building exercise at the ground level like i was saying at the district level at right. booth level of, of bodies were made above the booth level at the district level and so on and going up the pyramid each of these bodies was a 20 member one member body and there they gave reservation and they started reaching out see a lot of people say uh, one of the big critics of the bjp by people who don't like it is ki ye to election machine hai ki people think ki they just do election bazi right i mean they people, this machine gets activated they win the election and then rest is all nothing people are not automatons the machine, you can't just turn on a machine like that you can't just say yeah. well if i am a, uh, it's very difficult to get people to vote after all your core vote of hindutva has not increased there are many right. other voters who are coming in who will leave you also if, if tomorrow if, if things change so right. what i'm saying is that that's one so i'll give you an example in pilibit hmm. um i was traveling in pilibit and in pilibit the the samajwadi party sacked its the president the district president sometime oh. around uh, sometime before 2019 who was not a yadav and a yadav ml a yadav leader was made the president or the district right. president <clears throat> next day the guy who was sacked moved to bjp and he said ye to yadavon ki party hai now the point right. is that see people see this in 
just if you make a change at only at one metric, that's not because people see everything on balance. You see who's the MLA, who's the MP, ticket kisko mil raha hai, kaun hai. So you see the overall thing. And overall the thing shifted. Narendra Modi himself is an OBC. He became an right. OBC. He was not an OBC by birth. He became an OBC after the OBC list was changed. Uh, right. um, long before he became Gujarat Chief Minister, right? Um, the 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 the. If you look at uh, even now, even today, if you look at the current council of ministers of Narendra Modi, about sixty percent are again SC, ST, and OBC. Uh, in right. UP, STs don't matter. I mean, are very small. So there's only one ST reserve seat. But at the, at the council of ministers level, at the national level, that has changed. So I think, see. Um, Govinda Charya, the great ideologue of the BJP in the 90s, um, had said that Bhajapa ko agar aage badna hai, to usse apna chaal charitra aur chera badalna padega. This right. post 2014 BJP, what I call the new BJP, ne apna chaal charitra aur chera badla hai. The ideology has not changed. Ideology is the same as what it was. Uh, the examples that you laid out for us, Nalin, from the PDBT example, uh, there is this complex matrix of political representation. So you said when a, when a non Yadav was replaced by Yadav, that led to a revolt. Uh, explain to us what is so important about this political representation. This is like a huge, huge, huge thing because there are hundreds of castes at UP. Uh, what changes, say, for a PAL if he has a PAL? Uh, district president like what how is how does his life change so i think um see i think we have to absolutely remember that the states we're talking about the the bjp's uh for the fulcrum of the bjp's growth is in the hindi heartland right um uh 10 plus hindi speaking states uh and within that it's you take out up and bihar and it's a very different bjp uh, uh, right so um and all of these states um uh, and in hindi heartland in general is is basically if you compare it to south of the Vindhyas or uh, or the West India, it's really underdeveloped. Uh, it's like different yes. continents altogether. So in a in the context of a state where historically people have had great deprivation, when you really haven't had um, you know the kind of things that animate us so much on Twitter, the kind of debates about the idea of India, uh, secularism versus communalism, the things that matter. To um, to liberals, to academics, to thinkers, to intellectuals, many of these things on the ground have far. I mean, these are really important ideas, and then they matter a great deal. But what I'm saying is, when you are struggling for your next roti, then then those things become more important than um, abstract ideas. And in that context, represent why does why does India have such high voting rates? Because for most people. Uh, compared to the U.S., for example, um, yeah. um, in the U.S., the poor don't don't vote to, to the extent that they do in India. In India, elections are largely about uh, urban middle classes being re- irrelevant. They're really about the poor and rural India. That is because to those people, to the vast majority of Indians, who comes into power has a direct bearing on their day-to-day life. It has a direct bearing whether they will get an electricity connection which is working, whether they'll get a gas cylinder or not. Right. So uh, for their livelihoods. And in that, the point I want to make is that representation is one part of the picture. But I don't think we can understand this palimpsest without seeing it in totality. There are multiple reasons why the BJP grew the way it did. A significant part of it is the creation of a new kind of a social welfare state, which was. um, And what do I mean by that? It was powered by uh, direct benefit transfers. The coming together of new technologies of the of the mobile phone revolution in India, uh, which right. happened post 2015, which came after Geo, uh, the 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 boom in cheap data. India has the cheapest. It India has the highest per capita consumption rates on data compared to to North America and Europe, and the cheapest data. Uh, now, what that allowed you to do is created a new public. Uh, if you look at Google Trends now, um, uh, 90% of Google consumption is in uh, non English. Uh, actually more than much more than 90, 90%. Significant part of it is voice search. And most of it is coming from rural India and from tier three towns, not from urban India. Right. Now, what does this mean? See what um, it's not like the BJP created new technology. Much of this architecture was laid out by Manmohan Singh. What do I mean by this? See, every government spends money on welfare. It's not like Akhile Yadav didn't spend, spend money on welfare, on, on building roads, on bridges, uh, on flyovers. In fact, every time BJP does something, Agli Adav says, Sorry, ye to maine tha. Ye log right. right? 
सो वन ऑफ द थिंग दैट आई लर्न इन माई ट्रेवल्स वॉल्स नो बडी आप सोने की सड़क बना दीजिए लोग लो उसके लिए आपको वोट नहीं देंगे बट यू गिव समी मनी टू थाउजेंड रुपीज इन दर पॉकेट it directly comes to them that has a huge impact makes a big difference right yeah so so um, what happened look, look, i'll give you some context with numbers direct benefit transfers was not something that was started by the bjp it was manmohan singh's idea the aadhar was seeded by the upi government nandan nilikani was brought out of infosys he became the head of the uh, of the uaidi when they tried direct benefit transfers they tried it in uh, the first pilot project was rolled out in about 58 districts Uh, across india um uh, around from the 1st of january 2013 uh, right. and it the pilot happened for 7 or 8 months by the time the uh, by the time uh, they realized it was it, there was a lot of problems on the ground so by the time they tried they fixed it the upa lost power modi comes to power uh, in 2014 and by the way aadhar had so many debates within upa between chidambaram and pranam mukherjee ultimately it was enabled by the judgment of the supreme court right so right. so what happened by the way it was rolled out as as a as an outcome much of the debate was around privacy and things like that but the, it had a huge impact on the social welfare architecture so modi by the way had opposed it modi's genius was that when he becomes prime minister uh, he has a meeting with nandan nilekani on a topic which he had opposed as chief minister of gujarat and he then decides to back aadhar as well as its usage of that and the mobile phone with the state's social welfare delivery mechanism for direct benefit transfers and he gives it full political backing now here are some right. numbers for context in 2013 14 the 28 government of india schemes were part of the dbt architecture in 2018 right. 19 that number went up by 15 times to 434 schemes Wow. what does it mean in terms mm-hmm. of money um in 2013 14 and 2013 14 includes the manmohan singh period uh, half of it and some part of manmohan uh, of the modi period um 2013 14 in terms of money 7367 crore was spent um in direct benefit transfers by 2018 19 that had gone up by 29 times to 2.14 lakh crore what does it mean in terms of the people who benefited Uh, in terms of beneficiaries what the bjp calls labharthis that's the term that mm. came to the political lexicon after they started there were 10.8 crore labharthis beneficiaries in 2013 14 by 2018 19 that had gone up to 76.3 crore beneficiaries and if you add um, these these were direct cash benefits which people got if you add in kind benefits the growth was over 44 times right right uh, now what does this mean beyond the numbers pm kisan uh, pm kisan is basically what that farmers get 2 to 3000 rupees in their pocket 3 4 times in a year that was not invented by the bjp it started first originally by trs in october telangana. 2018 by the raitu bandhu scheme in telangana right. it worked they came back to par it was a very important right. part so the then it it was scaled up as pm kisan before the 2019 election right Right. Uh, it it helped the bjp overcome many of the issues around farmers i went to a village um, in saharanpur um, near the shakumbari devi temple that's the temple around from where you got tanat charity's campaign um, right. and this was a you know i met a sarpanch who um, was with the samajwadi party um, and i asked him ki bhai what does how are these schemes made a difference to your life aap bataiye to he said dekhiye imagine how much money has he and he said some main difference hai uh, pm awas yojana ka aur swachh bharat ka so i said how he said guess how much money has come into my village he says okay, all government schemes are done through the sarpanch so he said look right. in the last 5 years uh, i have spent about 50 lakh roughly um through various schemes but on pm awas and swachh bharat alone 5 crores has come gone through me and these schemes did not exist earlier now right. and a lot of the debate around swachh bharat for example was about whether india is 100% open defecation free or not right and and whether is aap bahar jaoge you go to any village you will always find somebody defecating somewhere right whether it is 95% 96% the whole debate has been around ki it's perfect hai ki the government claims 100% defecation but the real shift in of swachh bharat was not in public toilet it was in private toilets because right. the issue was that women do not have toilets they go to the fields they get molested a whole bunch of other things happen safety hazards and so on 
imagine how many toilets were built in a five year period in um, in uh, in up alone 17.1 million toilets were built between 1415 to 2018 90 they were part of the total 23.8 million toilets in up uh, 17.1 million toilets personal toilets were built there 164.1 million toilets were built nationally what does that mean see the state was not building these toilets it meant was i am a beneficiary if i meet that guideline i will get 12000 rupees in my account i'll first get 10000 rupees and i will build it then i show some photos they have to be geotagged uh, you can see the cms i've seen some of those systems it's proven that you built it something then you get the next tranche more than that in pm avas yojana and this is revolutionary pm avas yojana was not again a new see one of the big critique of the modi government has been by the opposition ki aapne naya kuch nahi kiya aapne purani scheme uthai uska aapne naam badla you change the name and you marketed it better so what was the great idea you built so it's basically just marketing if just looking at these two schemes um swachh bharat and pm avas yojana there was an earlier toilet scheme yes the name was changed but what was different was this direct benefit transfer thing uh, the right. money is now coming to the person same with pm avas and i think this is important to understand this there was an indira avas yojana that started in late 80s that has been on for perpetuity um they built many houses what used to happen with those houses often was the state built them they built them in this often in uh, firstly there was more corruption secondly it was in an area where if i have a maid who's living in my house you suddenly tell her ye basti jhuki jhok bhi hatao aapko 15 km dur hum ghar ek ghar de rahe hain now she her husband is maybe an auto driver her kids are going to a school here she has an ecosystem here she will not go there what is changed with pm avas yojana is that the state is not building that house for you this you are eligible yeah. if you are below the below poverty line you don't have a pakka house you are eligible somebody verifies based on the scs based on the socio economic census you are verified you are right. eligible or not you get 1.2 lakh rupees in your account one um and when you get that money in your account you build the house yourself again you get one tranche it's verified all that you get the next one but the biggest change that happened in the pm avas yojana was the state said and there was a pm avas yojana urban and there was a pm avas yojana gramin and they said we will prefer if you give it to women 68 17.1 million houses were sanctioned between 2013 14 and 2018 19 and can i tell you that 68% of these were either in the names of women alone or in the names of women jointly with their husbands but we are a deeply patriarchal country in this country women did not have inheritance rights to the parental property until the early 2000s right. if my sister and i our parents had died my sister does not did not have the right it to inherit that unless my father willed it to her that changed only in the early 2000s but only for people whose parents died from that point onwards not before that only in 2019 uh, um, in august the supreme court of india sorry in 2020 in the supreme court of india said this right now extends back in perpetuity you no know, matter when your father died both siblings sibling respective of gender will have right to parental property in such a country if six, if 11 million women get a house and 11 and one more than 1.2 lakh rupees in their account because they are the official uh, beneficiary of that and not their husband um, that is revolutionary because these are rural women many of these women will at least vote for bjp once right so this is almost like it's a i think uh, it's it's a, it's a philosophy i think arvind subramanian has called a new welfareism where uh, basically it's not only really dbt but even when the bjp gives goods in kind it's basically a private countable good right like you'll get a house you'll get a cylinder you'll get a toilet absolutely. like it's something that it's you privately own practically right um absolutely sure and show show me there's something more there is a cultural and social power dynamic involved it's not just about the money and and you know there's right. something i learned when i went to the villages that see pehle kya tha nariga again nariga modi didn't start Uh, uh, Congress started it. Nariga me kya tha? It was a great idea, but what was happening was that say there are five hundred people in a village. Now I am the sarpanch. I am showing there are eight hundred people. So firstly, I am taking three right. hundred people's money and pocketing. On top of that, the remaining five hundred, even though I am giving the money to them, I am taking a cut to get the money. Right. I am taking a ten percent, twenty percent, thirty percent cut. 
आई ओनली रियलाइज वन आई वेंट टू कपल ऑफ विलेजेस वेन दिस गाय सेट की देखिए अब दिस सरपंच टोल मी सर देखिए साहब ऐसा है Firstly, I can't now fudge the numbers beyond a point. There's some fudging that happens, but that percentage has come down drastically. Secondly, right. the power equation up kya hai ki now the money is not coming through me. It is going directly into that person's account through their mobile phone. Now, does it mean that I don't get a cut? I still get a cut because today I sanction a, a Swachh Bharat toilet or whether a PM Awas Yojana house or about Nariga. the money will come directly to the person but the with who is eligible to get it is still decided by the sarpanch so therefore the sarpanch will still demand a cut ki i have given you sanction today but for your next scheme for eligibility you know you still have to come to me so you still give me a cut but now the money is with that guy so now sarpanch mang raha hai paise so now the power equation is shifted suddenly so the guy is giving a much lower cut and that change hmm. changes the whole change that change is a great deal so in fact uh, one of the In, in one of the villages, in fact, there's a senior editor who told me he said he was traveling in 2019 through a village, the, and he saw that there was huge crowds on the on the village, and he thought that some festival is going on, so he stopped, and he and he wanted to know which festival is this because there was no public holiday on that day, and the whole village was out. It was like a fair, it was like a annual village fair atmosphere. So he asked them, "What is happening?" So then he realized somebody told him that that day the first installment of the PM Kisan Yojana money had come in. in that village right. that had led to that celebration this didn't happen this maybe just an isolated incident in that village but it kind of gave you a sense of you know you put direct money in somebody's pocket even if it's a small amount of money it changes something and this was the thing right. and now does everybody get a house no there was an example quoted in the book of a cobbler who was a, from the uh, one of the uh, scheduled caste uh, he was a valmiki so this guy went and asked him they were doing a survey a survey they asked him ki bhai who and this guy was a bsp voter huh? he had voted right. bsp for 30 years so this guy asked him ki aapko kya mila he said nahi hamare gaon mein na phala ko ye ghar mila phala ko ghar is aapko mila ki nahi mila he said mujhe nahi mila so the guy said then obviously you know you didn't get it right so how, how does hmm. make a difference to you nahi humko mila nahi lekin ummeed hai ki humko agle 2 saal mein mil jayega right so so a lot of voters who who started quest who were identity politics with sp basapa a lot of people now there is a core they would never leave you right i mean today even even today the basapa has over 30 35% roughly vote in 2020 right. who does that basapa right. still has 16 17% vote which is the core valmiki vote that's not leaving but the others who were not part of the power structure there from the non jatav or the non yadavs they started saying okay but suddenly i'm getting something here i'm neither getting political representation there nor am i getting money in my hand or relatively i'm getting more here now and i'm getting more representation here why would i not switch right so nalin you uh, uh, there's something that you laid out in your book that the bjp is an extremely representative party except muslim it's a, uh, it's a, it's a minus 20 formula in in up it goes into bat thinking that it's not going to get 20% of the votes uh and that was then uh, except uh, so i want you to break that down for us but, uh, but i also want you to uh, update this because of late uh, adityanath has been sending out feelers mr modi has been sending out feelers to pasmanda muslims which is basically backward caste muslims so the bjp it would seem like right now is trying to replicate what you described is done for backward caste hindus and to try and put in a politics of backward caste muslim identity uh and maybe possibly who some votes mr bjp had mentioned that uh, in the national convention in hyderabad couple of things strike out for me for there one contradiction of course is that the bjp's core plank is hindutva now i'm not sure how a mm. core hindutva voter would take to the wooing of any muslims whether they be ashrafs or pasmanda the other counter the other the, the other side of the coin of course is that uh, pasmanda muslims are very often victims of communal violence for example the the bulldozing that happened of houses was very often i think largely pasmanda muslim pasmanda muslim of course are the vast majority of indian muslim we i'm not sure we have an exact number because i don't think indian muslim caste is measured but there's no doubt that since the native muslims they'd be they did vastly outnumber upper caste so it's 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 on paper it's a great strategy but how do you think it will go out how do you think it will work out on the ground uh um, great question i'm um, sure thanks for that um i think and i do want to i think it's an important point to speak about 
um as, as like i said um the um see uh, historically uh, the bjp's BJ, i mean there's no question about the bjp's ideology right i mean uh, the core bjp voter has been the hindutva voter which is roughly 17 18% of of uh, of the vote um and then then it's built this coalition which brings it the other voters um many of them are floating voters some of them are now becoming more permanent voters who come into the bjp for reasons other than hindutva right now the muslims if you look at any election data it shows you that muslims have not been voting for the bjp and uh, um it's been negligible proportions now uh, this fault line has been at the center of um uh, has been a key fault line for the bjp from the time of its inception uh, from the jan during the jansen days um, and from 1980 onwards uh, as well so uh, a big deal was made about for example the fact um the symbolism of the fact that the bjp in 20 uh, um in the 2017 up assembly elections did not put up a single muslim candidate in a state right. where muslims are a significant number um uh, if you do not put up a single muslim candidate in india's most populous state what does that mean uh, this, uh, in 2019 in the lok sabha election the bjp did not put up a muslim candidate in up out of the 80 lok sabha seats or though it did put up muslim candidates uh, four or five in other states now um if from a real politic point of view and i'll come to the ideological point and the implication of this in a couple of minutes but from a real politic point of view uh the bjp's campaign managers fundamentally calculated that this was not such a huge change for one reason that if you look at the U, I, i tracked um up candidates fielded by bjp from 1991 in the lok sabha to 2019 um right. and the bjp always only had a token one or two candidates it never had more than one or two candidates so i'll give you some example 1991 zero muslim candidates um in up 1996 zero these were the years when the bjp became moved to being the single largest party in the country and largely driven by up 1998 one 1991 one these are the watch by years remember uh, 2004 two 2009 one 2014 1 2019 zero so what it did was it did away with the tokenism right because the calculation was muslims are not going to vote for us anyway why have the tokenism in yeah. lieu of that what they did was both at the central um, level and at the state level and here i at state level i mean yogi adityanath's uh, government now um, and i mean modi's government at central level what they did was they they um, um appointed a minister each so mukhtar abbas naqvi was made a minister uh, at the central level now he is uh, his term is over he has resigned um um uh, there's a minister in yogi adityanath's government uh, who's minister minister for minority welfare who was a pasmanda and that takes us to the other point that you raised yeah. the and uh, before i get to the pasmanda point i think what is striking to me is that there are several muslim seats seats uh, um Muslim Muslim seats are slightly misleading. What I mean to say is seats where Muslims are dominant and are therefore decisive, or were traditionally considered decisive factors in that election. So the idea was that no matter what your ideology, the traditional conventional wisdom was: if you do not have even some part of the Muslim vote, you cannot win. Right. What the BJP has done is to demolish that that idea, because if including in Muslim seats. so i looked at muslim seats very closely or muslim dominant seats is a more accurate term and mm. i seats and i defined muslim dominant seats as seats where muslims are more than 30% of the vote in up and what we find is that in 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 these muslim dominant or muslim significant seats we find that the bjp was started winning a majority of these seats from 2014 onwards um in up this is not because muslims were voting for bjp of course not Uh, this is because of polarization so what was happening was that in these seats typically um, the opposition parties would put up one two three candidates uh, most of them would be muslim candidates the muslims vote get split the bjp puts up a hindi hindu candidate um, and the hindu vote which traditionally was divided around caste gets polarized and it becomes a hindu muslim contest and the hindu candidate wins you look at um many significant muslim significant seats in up and this is a trend that has been constant since 2014 so polarization electorally helps the bjp 
right now uh, is that something which is a good thing is that some, what does it mean for uh, for uh, 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 for democracy for other things for representation uh, we've just had the first tribal woman president been elected and there is a, and there is a huge deal to be said for that i think it's a great moment um, in in the history of the republic um, what about muslim representation now uh, that's an important question um, i think um, how the bjp deals with this going forward is one of the key challenges for the bjp see the bjp is now reached up till this point um, now how does it sustain this it has replaced the congress as the primary pole of our polity now how do you sustain this and then how do you answer questions for example just now uh, you, we've seen the controversy around nupur sharma around the uh, around the prophet we've seen the response from islamic countries several islamic countries we've seen nupur sharma being suspended we saw the whole thing around the gyanwapi mosque on the mathura mosque uh, and then the rss chief coming out and trying to dampen uh, temperatures after that we saw what happened in ramnami one of the big challenges for the bjp in the book i've listed five challenges at the end um, going forward one of them uh, um, and we can come to that later but one of them is how it deals with the hindu muslim question going forward be, right. being it's being the party in power uh, brings with it other exigencies being the party in power um, uh, brings with it other responsibilities um, so now uh, on the question of pasmanda muslims i think the bjp tried uh, as a precursor to that um, they did, there was a massive outreach to muslim women which was the triple talaq board right, right. Um, the the prime minister made a big deal about it an amendment was passed um, uh, it was very much part of the bjp messaging the idea was did it lead to large numbers of muslim women voting for bjp i don't think so um, mm. right um, because there is no question the election data shows us um, all the post poll surveys show us you look at any agency that muslim votes the muslim vote is for the party which can defeat the bjp right, right? Uh, the csds data in 2022 showed us that about 5% of muslims voted for bjp oh no sorry about 8% uh, is what the csds data showed us in up now 8% is 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 a small number but it is more than what what i thought would would, would be correct i thought it would be lower what is this 8% mean driven by welfare i think it's been driven by welfare uh, some right. of it has been driven by women so earlier what used to happen was that even though muslim women may not have been voting a lot of people would say koshish thi now i think something has shifted so i did a dipstick survey um, in some villages hmm. and then i looked at the data overall what we found was and that's what comes back to the pasmanda muslim point the areas that i went to in up most of them were scheduled caste dominant uh, or muslim dominant and right. uh, when you ask the bjp leaders i asked many bjp leaders about this question they will say sabka saath sabka vikas they will say you know what we are doing is um, and in the quest scheme point of muslim in the point hmm. of welfare schemes i think that is borne out the data for swachh bharat for pm awas the two schemes that i looked at closely and right. the district surveys that i did in the villages that showed that and that's in the book um, um the uh, the the share of of muslim beneficiaries in pm awas yojana and swachh bharat is roughly commensurate to the share of the population so i don't think that's a problem but is that enough uh, uh, it may not be enough when in the age right. of bulldozer politics in the age of um, uh, rep- uh, of greater representation um, uh, you if you if you have large numbers of your citizenry feeling insecure that mm. that is not a very healthy thing so it is a challenge for the bjp the outreach to pasmanda muslims i think is a very significant one because now again it, we'll see how it plays out um there are and you would um i think there there are muslim scholars who would know this far better than i would but my understanding is broadly speaking there are three kinds of muslims if you uh, break it down by caste or social origin there are the ashrafs uh, very loosely speaking uh, um nobles um uh, of or, or uh, descendants of uh, um the muslim elites who came to india um, or, or the upper caste elites from india who convert from from the hindus who converted to islam right. um to some extent so sayyids pathans um, you know those kinds of categories then there are the ajlavs loosely speaking what is analogous to the backward classes arzals um, and i'm not sure if i'm pronouncing this the correct way uh, who are dalits there have been huge debates from the mandal commission onwards whether uh, originally about whether reservation should be extended to 
the backwards right. among Muslims and the Dalits among Muslims or not, and it was extended eventually. So, um, uh, for example, Ghachi Muslims in Gujarat were made part of the OBC list in the 90s, early 90s. Right. Ghachi yeah. Hindus uh, in Gujarat uh, uh, became uh, were given reservation as OBCs 10 years later in the late 90s. Right, right? now, um, the Sachar committee in 2004-5 counted roughly around 40% of Muslims as Pasmanda Muslims. Pasmanda Muslims are basically the Ajlavs and the Arzals put together, right? They're the non-elites among the Muslims, fundamentally. Right. Now, I think there is a sense or the calculation for the BJP would be, is uh, I, in my understanding would be, that if you are going to make bridges with Muslim communities or if you're going to start increasing that 8% into 10%, 15%, 20%. Right. You only have to break off, and I'm talking here only politically, right? I'm not making an intellectual point or about what ought to be or what not to be. Right. Is that if you want to go up to, say, 5% uh, 5% increase or 10% or 15% increase, um, the dominant discourse is run by elites. The elites will not come with you anyway because of, because, because of the polarization. But there are many who have benefited from social schemes. Now, there you may have an opportunity, just as the way some Muslim women may, may decide to vote for you because of the triple talaq thing, right? Um, how many of those actually are the case? I don't know. I mean, there's no scientific study of this. Now, if you reach out to Pasmanda Muslims, and there are many Pasmanda Muslim leaders who have welcomed this and who have said this, how will this translate onto the ground is anybody's guess. It's very early days on this. I think it has to be tested on the ground. But this is a very interesting outreach. Um, <laughs> Do you think there'll be a backlash from its core Hindu vote? Could be. Uh, I, I think um, in the uh, case of Nupur Sharma, there has been some backlash. Right. Uh, for example, if that is something to go by, cool. uh, um, there has um, the Gyanvapi mosque tensions have at least the public temperature has gone down a little bit in the last right. month or so. Some period, it is true. But on the Nupur Sharma case. Um, I think um, if you look at if you look at just Twitter alone, and that's not the best way of deciding what's happening. But um, the uh, there has been a backlash last by the extreme right. Uh, again, I think the BJP was attacked for not being right enough, which is quite rare. But on Nupur Sharma, that's what happened. Right? Exactly. Uh, so there right. were two critiques on the Nupur Sharma thing. One was that um, for those who opposed her being thrown out, was that well, she didn't say anything wrong. She may have said it in an angry manner. She may have reacted. The context was, but the and I'm only paraphrasing those who were saying it, right? I'm uh, that that Islamic scholars accept what she said, and therefore it was it was uh, there was nothing factually wrong in what she said. That completely ignored the context of that debate, um, uh, uh, and the fact uh, that many people would see that deeply disrespectful, which is why the BJP, which is so why you many think countries, something like that might happen with Pasmandas too, that it might get outflanked on the right. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lesser chance of that uh, of that happening, but that risk remains, and which is exactly why, when in a polarized atmosphere, the more polarized things get, the more difficult it is to bring the temperatures down. So it's a challenge, right. uh, and I think right. it, it is really how you negotiate it is where the skill is, uh, and there are many ifs and buts in that. So, but it's a it's a fascinating um, political act to watch, I think, and to track and to see how this evolves. It could go either way, but I think it's it's a it's a um, it's a good beginning. Where it goes, you know, we have to see. The final question that I want to uh, lay down for you, Nalin, is the other challenge along with, uh, you know, religion and caste for the BJP is very often state identity. So last year, uh, when it fought the Bengal elections, uh, very interesting, the Trinamool yeah. uh, brought up Bengali identity as a sort of counter to Hindutva. And it was wildly successful. The BJP was successfully paid, painted as an outsider. So a lot of the BJP's uh, algorithms, which worked so beautifully in UP, kind of failed in West Bengal against, you know, led by this. Uh, I mean, there were obviously many factors, but it couldn't get in this, you know, uh, you know, completely vertical Hindu vote. Many Hindu Bengalis voted for the Trinamool. Uh, and so on and so forth. And this is this is you know as you've written this is this is a this is a barrier that is faced in the south too. With the exception of Karnataka, the BJP yeah. very often goes up against this 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 wall of 
of of state identity. Tamil say that you know BJP is you know North Indian, uh, uh, North Indian party and so on and so forth. Is that I one of the interesting things I find here that this is not just an intellectual point. Um, if you look at data, BJP does perform better when the conversation is national in federal elections and Lok Sabha elections compared to state elections. In fact, as as things get more local, the BJP becomes relatively weaker. Still, obviously, very very strong. It is the central pole of Indian politics, but it becomes weaker. Like you know, it's it's much easier to predict a national election where the BJP is going to do well than a state election. Unpack that for us. What what are the what are the, what is the thinking? What is the what is the debate in the BJP around state identity? How is it looking to get around this? I think you're absolutely right. Um, if one of the key pillars of the BJP's rise uh, in its ideologically and for its supporters, apart from everything else, is nationalism, is this idea of a muscular Hindu as well. Um, but nas- but nationalism and um, uh, often you know gets beaten by sub regional identity. You're right. Um, and to and for context, um, um, if you look at say Odisha or West Bengal, in Odisha. In 2019, the BJP's vote share went up from 21.5 percent in in 2014 to 38.4 percent, um, and it won significant number of Lok Sabha seats. But at the same time, in a simultaneous Vidhan Sabha election, Navin Patnaik won, BJP lost. Right. Right. In Bengal, um, in the in 2014, uh, the BJP had 16.8 percent of the vote. In uh, 2019, it had over 40 percent of the vote, uh, 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 right? And it won a significant number of seats. But then, when the state election happened, the same thing happened. Mamta Banerjee swept, right? right. So you are right. See, if, if you have different kind of there are four kind of states in India. Um, there is a states where there is a straight BJP Congress contest. In those seats, the decline of the Congress, the BJP has a direct advantage. Um, the waning Congress, BJP state level and national level. Um, nationally, the BJP is an advantage state level. There is still some older dynamic happening, but a weakening Congress is, is getting more and more weaker. In states where there are strong regional satraps, and Naveen Patnaik, the way he deals with the BJP is very different from the way the Mamta Banerjee deals with it. But in both cases, the common factor is that they've been able to hold their own, at least in state level contests, if not in national level contests. Now, um, however, I'll add one more factor to the contest, which is that in the Northeast, the, see, the BJP it was always seen as a Hindi, Hindi-speaking Hindutva party. But in the Northeast, the BJP is now in, the, in power in most states. It has won Assam twice with a very large Muslim population. It is either in power directly or in alliance with others as a senior partner or a junior partner in almost every North in, Northeastern state. In states where Christian populations are as high as 80%, 90%, um, where, uh, where the, the uh, beef-eating states... Um, right, so um, uh, where the where the debate around beef is totally different from where how it is in Hindi heartland. Uh, I think that's a better way of putting it. But so the BJP at the state level is often very different from the dominant narrative of the BJP uh, as what we see it is. A BJP is a multi-layered political animal, right. if you like. Now, uh, you mentioned Karnataka. One of the reasons why south of the Vindhyas, the BJP has never been strong. One of the reasons why Karnataka is the one state where the BJP became uh, formed its first government, currently uh, has a government, um, and uh, is because, not because of Hindutva originally, but because of Lingayat, because of the caste factor. Because Lingayats, Karnataka politics was dominated by Lingayats and Bokaligas. The Lingayat vote, vote shifted to the BJP over the uh, from the 90s onwards. Um, Number one, number two, um, the Jant- the Janta Dal and what became JDS later that fundamentally colla- uh, that was an alliance with the BJP, which was basically the anti-Congress vote. So there was Congress was the primary poll. The anti-Congress vote was run by by uh, by what was the the offshoot of the of the Janta movement to Ramakrishna Hegde and others. Fundamentally, over the nineties, what happened was the BJP aligned with them, and many of them which had a party structure. Many of the Janta leaders, they had a party structure at the district level. Many of them defected to the BJP. There are significant numbers of the BJP. There are two kinds of BJP leaders in Karnataka. There are those who are the original um, leaders of the BJP from the beginning when BJP meant nothing in that state 
fundamentally from a sang parivar background from a hindutva background and then there is a very strong fulcrum that came from the loyed movement from the janata party which right. then defected to the bjp and they are very senior leaders in the bjp including including and they've been in the last government the deputy chief minister was one of those uh, in fact as you write in your book one of it faced less resistance also was karnataka is a very unusual linguistic state right yeah it's very very right uh, thanks for raising that right. sure that's a very important point see uh, and by the way and this goes to the original question you asked right in the last karnataka election um, sidaramaiya raised this point he talked about he, he portrayed the bjp as the ancient invaders from north india who right. he talked about pull case in two uh, and it uh, you know he he, he portrayed himself as uh, as the chalukya king pull case in two uh, you know who defeated the north indian emperor harsha and he talked about uh, you know this old narrative of north indian invaders coming in and so on right. that did not work in karnataka hmm. fundamentally because see karnataka is not a hmm. linguistic state in a way that kerala is or tamil nadu is tamil nadu has a long history has a deep history of of dravidian uh, nationalism it has a deep history right. of, of of tamil culture and identity uh, kerala is a malayali speaking state um, but in uh, it, it, you know it has a lineage from travancore and so on karnataka is the most multilingual state in india uh, apart from kannada there are five languages spoken in karnataka in significant right. numbers the second most popular most spoken language going to census in in karnataka after kannada is urdu Right. after that you got a marathi speaking karnataka then you got a right. tamil speaking karnataka so issues regional language uh, nas- sub nationalism is often deeply linked with language so bengali identity is deeply is significantly about the bengali language or linked to it uh, in karnataka those concerns do not resonate to the extent right. they do in other states so therefore i think karnataka is different however to take your question a bit forward in telangana now what's happening in these states is i think telangana is a state where bjp is making good advances um the reason for that is that unlike in the north where the bjp is now the party of the establishment or the new establishment in st- in these states whether it is west bengal whether it is odisha whether it is telangana where the bjp has replaced either the congress or another party or a combination of both those parties as to become the second pole of the polity right in those states it is emerging as the anti establishment party right. so anybody now if you what does that mean now you have a government of trs in telangana that is now in its second term uh, right uh, anybody who is opposed to that government has no option but to be with the bjp because the right. congress has disappeared in telangana the co- if, if the congress had been strong people would have had two options but if you're an ambitious politician looking to go up where do you go the only option is bjp a good example is one recently a very senior cabinet minister from trs quit he tried to go to the congress didn't work with congress is in flux over right. there joined bjp and he won a seat in a stronghold of the trs in the lok sabha election of uh, 2019 the bjp won 3 3 to 4 seats in telangana two of them were in trs strongholds including in a, in, a, in, a, in a, including uh, in karimnagar and nizamabad right in fact that's Not the in same state. dynamic that works in bengal actually so yeah. because the cpm could not oppose the trinamool so very often people who were anti trinamool uh got on to the bjp i'm going to stop this fascinating discussion here nalin because we're really out of time and I'm, i'm sure we can uh, we can go on and on about this if anybody is really interested in deep diving into this i would really recommend nalin's book the new bjp uh, give it a shot it's it's got a lot of data it's got a lot of information it's got a lot of uh, geeky stuff that uh, political nerds could uh, dive into uh, thank you so much for joining us on scroll right and it was a pleasure chatting it was a, it was a, it was it was lovely thank you very and, much shoib uh, um, you said before we started before we went on air that uh, Uh, that let's make it a nerdy conversation and nerd being nerdy is good and loved having this chat and thank you for the time all right thank you so much nalin i think we really we really hit the nerd meter here thank you so much for joining us thank you so much for watching and listening viewers bye bye